Canadian immigration policy has a checkered past, even as it was essential to building the country we know today. Joining us now from the nation's capital for the historical picture of how governments of yore channeled immigrants to diverse parts of Canada, we welcome Laura Matacoro. She is assistant professor in the Department of History and Classical Studies at McGill University. And Laura, we're happy to have you on our program tonight. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks. It's great to be here. Glad to hear it. Tell us how historically, because this is an issue that we've returned to on this program many times, how historically has Canada populated its rural areas? It's a fascinating question because the history of rural population really goes to the core of post-Confederation immigration policy. When we talk about opening up the Canada West or the Canadian West, it really was a policy that was rooted in the economics of the late 19th century, where Canada was a largely agricultural society. And the real, the real objective for the federal government after Confederation was to figure out how to populate the Canadian West. And this meant passing things like the 1872 Dominion Lands Act, which started to give homesteads of 160 acres to people who were willing to move across the country and settle the West. And then with the Laurier government and the advent of Clifford Sifton as Minister of the Department of the Interior, we see active recruitment of migrants from Europe and from Britain with the express purpose of settling the Canadian West. And this is, of course, uh, a history that's bound up with that of Indigenous dispossession. Uh, it's not like the Canadian West was empty, so there was a very, very aggressive policy and process that involved the surveying and the redistribution of land, the negotiation of numbered treaties. But essentially, Canada's early immigration story, if we go back to the, the immediate post-Confederation period, is one of using the economic draw of the agricultural economy to recruit migrants to settle the Canadian West and to secure the, the territory uh, from fears of you know, American encroachment and things like that. And how well did those incentives work? They worked really, really well, uh, depending on who you ask. In terms of numbers, uh, millions, millions of immigrants settled the Canadian West in a period of two decades. So it was a radical transformation of the landscape. Uh, and that had everything to do with a very, very aggressive uh, recruitment policy that was introduced under the Laurier government in particular. Sir John A. Macdonald had the idea of settling the Canadian West, but it wasn't until Clifford Sifton came along and really envisioned uh, a, a very dramatic uh, promotion scheme, uh, envisioned recruiting um, immigrants, migrants from from Europe, from Northern Europe, from Russia, in a way that hadn't uh, been thought of previously. The traditional focus had been, of course, on British migrants and French migrants. But with the Sifton uh, uh, policies, it was really looking at who could be a solid agricultural worker in the Canadian economy. And he cast his gaze to Northern Europe and to Russia in particular. And so this was a real shift. Uh, in terms of immigration policy. We are going to take a look at a few posters that were put forward at the time. I guess this was sort of the government's marketing campaign uh, trying to show, here's what's waiting for you, immigrants, if you come across. So let's start to see these. There's the first one. This is the Canada West cover. And, uh, well, it, it all looks very green and pastoral and beautiful. There's uh, another one in which says you can own your own home. And once again, very green of uh, very rural animals frolicking in the foreground. Own your own home in Canada. It looks quite beautiful. Uh, another Canada West cover from a magazine. There's uh, just a typical scene, I guess, on the farm. There's some baling of hay, and everybody looks very happy and hearty and hale and waving to the cameras, and it, it looks like a beautiful slice of Canadian life. I guess my question is, how accurate was that, in fact, to the truth? Well, it's a great question. I recently showed these posters to my students, and you can imagine we were looking at these images shortly after 40 centimeters of snow fell in Montreal. <laughs> and the immediate comment from the students was, where is the snow? Uh, well, there's these, none in those pictures, promote, that's for sure. There's Exactly. There's absolutely no snow. It's golden. The, the colors are very warm. It's obviously very inviting in terms of promotional materials. It really does paint a beautiful image of Canada in the summer. Uh, and it was, you know, can, the Canadian government was not unique in terms of advertising uh, its, its uh, landscape. Um, you know, there was competition from the United States and other settler colonies like Australia and New Zealand were also recruiting and trying to get 
uh, migrants to settle in their in their countries. Um, and so these promotional materials, as you can imagine, do exaggerate what uh, prospective homesteaders might encounter. So the deal that was offered to uh, migrants in Northern Europe and Russia and Britain, as, as I mentioned previously, was that they could have 160 acres of land. And this was all part of the government's efforts to uh, put First Nations and Métis people, uh, you know, to, to create reserves and, and to, to transform the economy into an, a modern agricultural economy. So settlers uh, were given 160 acres of land, and the deal was that they had to do the work in terms of building their, their homes, settling. So this idea of, you know, a farm waiting for you to simply come along and start cultivating was somewhat misleading. But it was definitely a, a campaign that, that resonated with folks who were facing economic difficulties or political persecution in their homelands. For them, it was an opportunity to, to try something new. And so people did embark on the journey uh, to Canada. Uh, many people were disappointed in terms of how much hard work uh, was expected of them. That hadn't been part of the promotional materials. Many people went on to the United States. So this history of migration between Canada and the U.S. obviously has, has long, long roots. And we can see it in this period as well. People were discouraged by the kind of land that they were given. And many went on to the United States to try their, their fortunes there. Well, let me pick so, up on that. Uh, the, the kind of land yes. that they were given, as you've described it. Now, certainly, you know, during the depths of the Depression and the Dust Bowl and so on, uh, you know, arable conditions were terrible. But in the main, what kind of land was waiting for them? So the, the issue with the land was that it hadn't at all been cultivated. So it was a lot of work to, to get the, the farms up to a level where they would be um, productive, and you can imagine the kind of labor that would go into to clearing the land. So there was there was um, some confusion and some disappointment around just how much labor they had worker or sorry. Um, these agricultural workers had to invest in, in settling the land. The other thing that happened was that there were transportation companies and agents who distributed the promotional materials and didn't always sell or give the land that they were responsible for, for transferring. Uh, there was an idea that if they held on to the land, they might actually be able to sell it at more lucrative prices later on. And so we know that not all of the best land was given to those who were coming uh, as a result of these promotional campaigns. There was some brokering that went on in between that meant that some of the middle people were benefiting uh, rather, than, rather than the settlers themselves. Tell me about, uh, I, I presume it was the policy to try to get as many immigrants as possible into rural areas, and was part of that thinking that they didn't want these new immigrants from strange faraway places hanging out in the cities of Canada? So it's a great question because I would say there are actually two dynamics to the history of immigration policy in Canada. We think about the question of rural settlement, which really has been a question that has characterized the policies of settlement historically. So one is the economic um, factor, which is thinking about what kind of economy we saw in Canada historically. And until the Second World War, Canada is still a largely agricultural economy. So people were being encouraged to settle rurally because the economy was still agricultural and rural. So it wasn't a question necessarily of, um, you know, concerns about immigrant character, though that definitely existed. It was definitely bound up with the um, agricultural economy that existed at the time. And as I say, that, that agricultural dominance continued until the Second World War. The other factor, though, is the, is the one that you alluded to, this question of assimilation and what kinds of characters were being recruited to Canada. And by the late 19th century, we do see increasing industrialization, so the urban centers are growing. And along with that industrialization and the increasing urbanization, there is this concern about the moral character of Canadian society. And it plays out in urban centers uh, in a particular way in that immigrants were targeted there was concern about uh, their ability to, to fare in urban centers. Uh, and so the, there, there are concerns about um, settlement in that context. But the question of settling people rurally is not a question of assimilation until the late 20th century. It really is an economic driver until the Second World War. I wonder if part of your interest in this subject is not merely academic, but also personal. Tell, tell me about your ancestors. Uh, so uh, it is personal. Um, I have 
uh, a very, very fascinating family history. One, uh, Marukoro is a Japanese name, so Madokoro. Um, and my uh, father's family uh, settled in British Columbia, so I have Japanese-Canadian heritage. And then on my mother's side, uh, my grandfather was a Jewish refugee, so he came to Canada in the context of the Second World War. He was initially, uh, he initially went from Germany to, to England, and then he was transferred to Canada and placed in a camp uh, in Sherbrooke, Quebec, uh, which is very close to where I grew up. Uh, and he ultimately um, became a, a professor at the University of Toronto. So I have this history of migration uh, and displacement on both sides of my family. So interestingly enough, the, the admonition from the immigration minister back in the day, Mackenzie King's Mr. Blair, who said none is too many when it came to Jewish immigration to Canada, that didn't catch your family, I guess. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, there were uh, there was a, an agreement between uh, the British government and the Canadian government to take some of the the German POWs from the UK to Canada, and in that mix, there were also. Uh, Jewish refugees. So you can imagine, I can. I, I, one of these days I will write a book about uh, camp life because both my grandfathers were in camps during the Second World War. Uh, but yeah, my grandfather uh, was a Jewish refugee who, who did come to Canada. So hmm. he, he and Mackenzie King had a lot to say about both sides of my family, I think. <laughs> well, when you write that book, I will read it and we'll have you on this program and talk about it because you've got it on both sides. That is a fascinating family history. I, I wonder, I mean, obviously, when they brought immigration policies forward 90, 100, 150 years ago, some of what they had in mind back then would not stand up to the standards of today. Is there stuff you look back at today that makes you cringe? Yes and no. I have to say that as a historian, I think a great deal about the continuities and the foundations of today's current immigration policies. And so I know, uh, especially from, from working with my students, that there is a tendency to sort of celebrate how different we are today. But things like uh, the Chinese head tax, uh, continuous journey regulations, which uh, were designed to, to keep out migrants from South Asia because it was impossible for them to arrive directly in Canada. And so despite the fact that there was a principle of free movement in the British Empire, the Canadian government found a way uh, to exclude migrants from, from India. So those two, those two very exclusionary policies, which we know a fair bit about, you know, the head tax that was designed to keep uh, Chinese families from settling, and then, as I say, uh, the continuous journey regulations that kept South Asian migrants away. Um, we see echoes of this in the present in terms of the, how expensive it is to pay for an immigration application. So we think about how that translates historically the idea of a head tax that was punitive, that made it difficult. Uh, to migrate. Similarly, things like the Safe Third Country Agreement, which prevents refugees from making a refugee claim in Canada if they've already made one in the United States, because the idea is that the United States is safe. There's, a, there's an interruption to their journey there, and we can see that similarly. Um, we can see historical resonance in terms of the continuous journey regulations. Hmm. So there are things that make me cringe, uh, but there are the, I cringe, and then I also think about how enduring uh, the policies of exclusion are. Um, in terms of immigration policy, I had the pleasure of chatting with one of my students recently, and he said, how would you summarize, you know, in two words, the history of Canadian immigration policy? And I said, I would describe it as selective and exclusive. Even as we have welcomed, you know, millions and millions of people to the country, there has always been selection criteria. There have always been categories of refugees and migrants that the Canadian government hasn't wanted to support. And this is as much a part of the history of immigration policy as is the history of welcome and settlement and efforts to encourage people to come and to stay. Mm. Let me circle back to something you mentioned uh, right at the outset of our interview. And, and that is, have you in your studies been able to find any discussion from back in the day, whether it's Johnny McDonald's time or Wilfrid Laurier's, which, which would suggest some understanding or empathy for the notion that these immigration policies were probably going to throw indigenous people off land on which they had lived and raised families and had traditions for thousands of years. 
Yeah, I wouldn't say empathy is uh, what comes to mind. The, the settlement of the Canadian West was deliberately designed to ensure that Indigenous peoples were removed from their lands. And so, uh, as I mentioned, the Dominion Lands Act, uh, the negotiation of the numbered treaties, the policy, I mean, what we talk about now in, in, um, in the scholarship is a history of settler colonialism, where colonialism is perpetuated by the individuals who come and settle. So it's not just the British government, it's not just the Canadian government in Ottawa, but all people who come and settle on unceded uh, Indigenous lands or lands where treaties have not been upheld bear a responsibility for colonial practices. And so when I look historically, I don't see a great deal of empathy. I actually see a deliberate policy that was designed to secure the land uh, and remove Indigenous peoples from, from their traditional lands. So the Government of Canada's immigration policies were very, very successful as they related to whites coming over here, but not so much as it related to the people who were already here. Fair to say? I would say that exactly, yeah. Was Canada seen by countries around the world as some kind of sanctuary, where if things were not going well in the home country, this was a good place to go to get away from it all? It's an interesting question of how and when we start to think about countries as sanctuaries and or, or humanitarian nations, which is definitely something that we talk about in Canada in our current moment. And if you look historically, the language of sanctuary and being humanitarian really starts to emerge in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and in my mind, it's not a coincidence that that timing um, relates to increasing diversity in terms of Canadian immigration policies, um, the emergence of official multiculturalism. These are all things that contribute to a growing sense of being a humanitarian nation. And, and in, as well, uh, the large numbers of refugees that are displaced uh, and moving in the post-Second World War period. But historically, the idea of refuge is not what animated movement to Canada. It really was economic concerns. Um, people were persecuted in Russia. Uh, if we look at the Dukabors, the Mennonites, um, Jewish peoples, there was all kinds of persecution. And so there's no doubt that they were looking for a place that felt secure and safe, but they were also doing so as they thought about the livelihoods and their possibilities for building a life that they could support their families with. And so the idea of persecution and sanctuary is really important, but we can't remove that from the economic dimension as well. And this is one of the challenges in our contemporary moment, is we try and tease out what is the political motive, what is the sanctuary motive, what is the economic motive, when in fact these are often all combined. And mm -hmm. so early settlement in the late 19th century well, involving Dukabors and Mennonites, they were taking advantage of the settlement schemes that the Canadian government was offering, but they were also leaving uh, situations where they were being persecuted. Uh, and the question then is, how do, you, how do you parse out those multiple motives? Because they are multiple um, historically and in the present. Well, let me throw a little, uh, another little wild card into the mix here. H have you, again, in your studies, um, got a good sense about whether or not we're hearkening back to those posters earlier, which showed, you know, a glorious life was awaiting these immigrants when they arrived at their new country. When they experienced their first winter or when they experienced the Dust Bowl, any sense about whether or not the majority of these immigrants thought this country has sold us a bill of goods? This is nothing like what we thought was waiting for us. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say majority. It's hard to tell uh, uh, sort of empirically, but we know from correspondence with the federal government that there was a great deal of discontent, you know, after the first winter. If we look in the post-First World War period, uh, there was, a, there was a, an intense settlement scheme with the British government called the Empire Settlement Act. And in that, under the auspices of that legislation, there were 3,000 families that were meant to come from the UK and settle in Canada, sort of building on uh, the settlement practices of the late 19th century. So migrants were given basically a loan and they had a few years to pay it off. And the British government was paying for their transportation to Canada. So this is a continuation of efforts to get the Canadian economy going. The British had too many people uh, basically ready and willing to work after the First World War. So uh, they were, these people were encouraged to come. We know that about a thousand of the people who registered under the family scheme never came because they started to hear reports about 
how hard the work was. There was an agricultural depression, uh, sort of 1920, 1921, that made the work on the land all the harder because economically uh, it was just that much more challenging. So we know from numbers of people who didn't come at certain points that they were definitely hearing stories from family members and neighbors who were already here about how hard it was. And we also know from correspondence with the government, especially in the Great Depression, people are writing in and saying, you've got to be kidding me. This is not what I signed up for. You are not helping me. Uh, so there definitely is a historic, there's historical evidence of, of disgruntlement for sure. Well, Laura Matacoro, I look forward to reading the book that you're going to write someday on your family history. Uh, you had it going on both sides now, and we're grateful that you could spare some time from us and McGill University to be with us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, it was a great pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.